Hey, everybody, welcome to the Addiction Unlimited podcast, where you get to learn everything you want to know about addiction and recovery. I'm your host, Angela Pugh, co founder of Kansas City Recovery, life coach, and recovering alcoholic. To learn more about me, you can listen to episode zero on your podcast app or find us on the web at addictionunlimited.com. Well, hello, my friends. Welcome to episode number 137 of the Addiction Unlimited podcast. I've got something cool coming up for you today. We're going to do a little compilation, a little collection of frequently asked questions. So I get questions, obviously, all my social media platforms, people message me, ask questions, questions in the Facebook group, email. Everybody's got a lot of questions about (laughs) sobriety and getting sober, quitting drinking, all of those things. One of my favorite things to do is answer questions in live videos. So I'll go live, usually Facebook and YouTube, I'll go live and just do maybe a five or 10 minute video answering whatever questions have come in or what's popular at that time. So what I did is I took a few of those videos, only a few, not nothing crazy, but I took a few of those videos and I took the audio from them and we're going to do a compilation episode of frequently asked questions. And these are three questions literally that I get over and over again, all the time, forever. Most popular things that come up all the time in recovery. And we're going to start with a big struggle in the 12-step world, sponsorship. Most people get a really weird feeling about sponsorship, myself included. I was the same way when I got sober and I first started going to AA. It didn't make sense to me. You know, by nature, the majority of us with addiction are very um, rebellious and (laughs) obstinate, and uh, we don't like authority usually in any form. And I think there's this sense of like sponsors are your boss, right? They're going to tell you what to do. And like a good, super immature alcoholic, like I was when I quit drinking, super emotionally immature, that was my thought process around sponsorship. And I was like, I don't need somebody telling me what to do. I don't need somebody to call and ask what I need to buy at the store or how I need to act in this situation. You know, I was just such I was such an immature, self-centered little brat, right? I didn't understand at all the dynamic of sponsorship and what it is really meant to do, and that this is a person being of service to me for free, giving me their time and energy and knowledge that I, I just didn't even have the capacity to understand it from that point of view, because of course, I was completely selfish and self-absorbed and only thinking about how it would affect me. How's this going to work for me? How do I feel about it? You know, I'm so glad I have grown out of that. Really, really grateful that my sponsor taught me (laughs) how to have a more mature, grown-up, humanistic approach to life, right? In that service thing. A sponsor is not your boss, A sponsor is just someone who has walked this walk before you, has gotten farther than you, and they're going to help you figure it out to get farther also. So here is the audio from a Facebook Live I did about sponsorship. In honor of full transparency, like I was super weird about sponsorship when I got sober. It was not a concept that I was like down for immediately right out the gate. Um, It was a struggle for me. So... I get where you're coming from. Also, in my sober living houses, I see this a lot too. I feel like we have a tendency to kind of overthink it. And remember, you're not marrying this person, right? This is no different than if you hire a coach or something. Like, you can fire us as your sponsor. And as your sponsor, I can fire you too, you know? So don't feel like you're getting into this major commitment and there's no way out of it and it's so serious and like this person is going to be your boss or something. Like that's not what it's about at all. The other thing I wanted to talk about is 
remember that we are just people as sponsors. Like literally we are just people just like you. We have our own issues. Every single sponsor kind of has their own way of doing things. You know, many years ago when I really sponsored a lot of people, I did ask them to call me every day. And I had good reason for that because my time is fairly limited, right? And if I'm going to work with somebody, I will give you every ounce of energy and time that I have, but I need to know that you're really in it and that you're willing and that you're in a place that you're ready to work for your sobriety because it's not always easy and it doesn't always feel good. So if you can't do something as simple as calling and checking in and leaving a message, especially like if you can't call when things are going well, then I definitely know you're not going to call when things aren't going well, right? So if a sponsor says, call me every day and you don't want to do that, just have that conversation, right? Maybe that person isn't the right fit for you, but as sponsors, we are perfectly allowed to, to have our own process and to set things up the way we feel is the best way to do them. And everybody is going to be different in that process. I don't sponsor a lot anymore. My time is really limited. I sponsor one or two people. Um, I love doing it. I love being involved with people and watching that growth. I just don't have a ton of time, so I'm not gonna take on a lot of sponsees when I can't give them the time that they need. So I just wanted to really make that point that I don't want you to overthink it, you know? And I definitely don't want you to be like scared away from the program and 12 steps because you're freaked out about the sponsor issue. If you need to take a minute and not have a sponsor in the beginning, you are perfectly allowed to do that. Don't feel like when people give you suggestions in the rooms, if they ask you if you have a sponsor, don't feel like that means they're judging you if you don't. You're judging yourself and you're judging the people that are asking you. That's where the judgment is coming in, right? It's not about somebody else judging you. It's the judgments you're making about how you feel not doing those things, right? So just don't put it on other people. But also remember, we're just people too. Like I have issues and struggles. I have ups and downs just like you do. I'm an alcoholic too. <laughs> so just because I have more practice at being sober, the only thing that's different for me today, the only thing that's different for me today is that I am better at making myself do the things I don't want to do, right? I still have ups and downs. I have really down moments and they can last for a little while sometimes. I'm, I'm just kind of coming out of one, I think. But at this stage of the game, the only thing that saves my ass is that I know to get up off my ass and I know the steps to take and I will reach out to people because I don't wanna drink. I'm not gonna do anything to compromise my sobriety. So that's the only difference. I'm just better at taking that action because I know I'm super vulnerable if I'm not feeding my sobriety and taking care of myself. But again, don't overthink it. You're not marrying the person, right? You don't have to work with them forever. If it's not the right fit and you realize that a month in or something, bail. It's okay. It's okay to say to somebody like, this isn't working out. What usually happens is people just stop calling you. As a sponsor, like people just stop calling. So that's how they break up with you. And that's all right. Like nobody as a sponsor, like I'm not dying because sponsees break up with me. It's okay. <laughs> you know, we can work together later in a different capacity or something. I don't know. But don't overthink it. Don't put too much weight on that. A sponsor is not a magical person. This is not a unicorn with all the magical answers for you. It's just somebody that has been sober already, that has gone through some trials and tribulations and stayed sober. And we are happy to show you how we did it. That's all. And that's all. <laughs> that is, that's all it is. It is, it's a relationship. It's a friendship. And you know, I tell people this all the time, even in building your tribe and just having other sober friends, it's really important to build those relationships when you feel good, when everything is going well. That's when you are reaching out to your friends, having conversations, shoot a text, hey, what's up today? Do you want to go get coffee next week? Whatever. You have to build those relationships just like a sponsor when everything is going well. Because like I said in the snippet, if you do not reach out to someone when you feel good, you definitely will not reach out when you feel bad. 
So think about it in those terms, right? You want to build those relationships, build your tribe, build that friendship with your sponsor, develop a level of comfort with people. Because if you really want to stay sober, you're going to reach out to somebody when you're thinking about drinking because you really don't want to drink. The people that think about drinking and they get caught in that kind of relapse mode and they're thinking about it more and they're doing the juggling act, should I, shouldn't I, maybe just this one time, I can start over again tomorrow. The people that really want to drink are going to stay in that mindset because they really want to drink. If you really don't want to drink, as soon as that thought pops into your head, you're going to start reaching out to people. Hey, what's going on? How's your day? What's happening? You want to have coffee? Whatever. You're going to reach out to people because you want to take the power away from that thought process. If you don't reach out to people, all you're doing is protecting your option to drink because you really want to drink. Next up, we're going to talk about managing stress and anxiety. It is no secret people with addiction have some pretty high levels of stress and anxiety. Our brains are wired a little bit differently. We internalize things a little differently. And anxiety is a killer, right? Like boredom. See, people overlook boredom, but boredom's a big one too. But stress and anxiety. And this was a video I did early in quarantine. So I'm not sure you might hear me talk about being quarantined and things being closed, whatever, but stress and anxiety were so high at that point that all of my inboxes and messages and everything were just being inundated with how do I cope, how do I cope, how do I cope? And that's why I did this. The great thing about this and why I wanted to share it with you guys today in this compilation is there are some very specific, very simple action steps you can take right now that you can use over and over again to manage stress and anxiety. Here we go. So one of the things we talked about in the group today was what I call a bliss list, right? A bliss list is I have my clients do 20 to 25 things, write them down, 20 to 25 things that the very moment you think about it, it brings a smile to your face. Okay. For me, for sure. Hands down. Number one is my dog, Lord Henry. He's number one on my bliss list. There's no way to think about him and not feel happy and feel love and feel connection and all that warm and fuzzy stuff. Um, another one for me is the beach right? Like I'm a scuba diver. I love the ocean. I love the beach. California is my second home, right? So the moment I think of the beach, spending time at the beach, or even the oceans being on a dive boat or, you know, deep sea fishing. I love to do that too. I think of the ocean. It immediately brings me bliss. It makes me happy. And another one are my nieces and nephews, right? Like two of my nephews right now are little bitty babies. And I have to tell you, nothing makes my heart feel fuller or happier than when I think about their little giggles, you know, and we have shared family photo albums through Google. So we don't even have to be with each other, right? We're constantly posting pictures and videos. And like, I can just think of those little baby laughing faces and there's no way for me to be sad. So Think about what your list would be. What is your bliss list? Like 20 to 25 things. And I say 20 to 25 because I want it to be challenging, right? It's easy to sit down and think of five or 10 things that make me happy. But I want you to really push yourself. Think of 20 to 25 things. Really push yourself and dig deep to finish that list of just the things that make you feel happy. Um, Another way that you can kind of use social media as a little, I call this a sober hack, right? Because you can really tailor your social media to support you, whatever you're wanting to be thinking about, right? I do this with my sobriety for sure. I curate my feeds to be really fun, funny, positive, sober people stuff. So as soon as I log on, I'm seeing really fun, positive sober people stuff and it keeps my sobriety front of mind and making sure that I'm feeding my sobriety and nourishing it and making it stronger you can do the same thing with your energy and your happiness right a big bliss list thing for me is my dog has an Instagram 
not because my dog needs to manage his own Instagram page, but because everybody that follows him are puppies, right? It's all dogs and puppies. So I can pop on his Instagram and in a split second, I'm inundated with puppies and happiness. Who doesn't get happy with puppies, right? Or kittens. So it's brilliant. The other thing I told everybody to think about too is jumping on Pinterest. Like that's a great spot. I have a Pinterest I think it's under my name, Angela Pugh. You could also find it through Addiction Unlimited, but I have several boards where I just post really happy, positive, forward-thinking things that keep my energy in a good spot, especially in this time when everybody's anxiety is so high, everybody's energy is depleted. There's so much fear right now of the future and fear the unknown. Like we have no idea what's going to happen with this thing. We have no idea how close to flattening the curve we are or how close we are to some relief or a vaccination or a, 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 an effective treatment. We have no idea. We don't know when we're going to be able to come out of our houses. I don't know when the gym is going to be open, right? There are a lot of things to feel anxiety and stress about. And we have to also spend time figuring out solutions so that we don't sit down and just obsess about that anxiety and fear. Okay, so think about, take a few minutes, grab a pen and paper and do your bliss list. 20 to 25 things that just make you feel happy the moment you think about them. The other big one for me is holiday season at my mom's. It doesn't matter if it's Thanksgiving or Christmas, like my brothers are there, my nieces and nephews are there, we're all in one place at one time and there's great food and it smells amazing and everybody's laughing. Like that, just envisioning that, sitting in the living room for the holidays, super, super happy, blissful moment. This last one really comes up a lot. This is hands down one of the most popular questions I get and see pretty frequently in the Facebook group too. It's about non-alcoholic beer and wine. Well, and I guess spirits now. Now, non-alcoholic drinks, whatever. <laughs> Let me know what you think about this one. This is such a tough question because honestly, I can't tell you, it's not like there's one answer for every single person. I can't tell you like, yes, this is good or no, this is bad or yes, this is okay for you. You really have to know yourself. And you hear me talk all the time about really being clear on who you are and who you want to be in your sobriety. And that is so important in this conversation too, because you have to know what's okay with you and you have to be able to be really honest with yourself about that, right? If it, if you're drinking a non-alcoholic beer and, and it does bother you or it's making you feel some type of way, you have to be comfortable enough with yourself to stop and put it down and drink something else. I can definitely share my experience with you and how this worked for me. I tried drinking non-alcoholic beers super early in my sobriety, literally probably in my first six months. And many of you know, I was a bartender for many years. I continued bartending well into my sobriety because it's the only job I ever had. I didn't know how to do anything else. And it really didn't bother me to be a bartender. I know some people that would be really hard, but for me, it wasn't a big deal. You know, when I lived in Los Angeles in my twenties, bartending all over Hollywood and Beverly Hills, I always worked with other bartenders who were sober. So I think it just didn't seem like a big deal to me to be a sober bartender. But anyway, I was at the bar with a bunch of my friends and I think I had that thing where I just wanted to fit in. And I know that's something that we struggle with when we get sober. I just wanted to look like everybody else that was sitting around me. So I got non-alcoholic beer and I was a beer drinker my whole drinking life. I was a beer drinker. Like later as my illness progressed, I definitely started adding other things. You've heard me talk about like tequila is the greatest love of my life because it really was for many years in there. And I drank rumple mints at the very end, which was the beginning of the end for me. <laughs> but, but for all the years before that, I really was primarily a beer drinker and so beer was hard for me. So I got a non-alcoholic beer and I'm sitting there with my friends and I'm drinking it. And it didn't like at first it didn't bother me. Um, I, I would definitely say I drank it just as fast as I drank a regular beer. So I kept drinking them and kept drinking them and kept ordering them. I'm going to the bathroom every 10 minutes. You know, I mean, it was just like I was drinking. And at some point 
I hit this place where I got a little almost irritated because I was doing all the drinking, but I wasn't getting the buzz, you know, and I was an alcoholic. So for me, drinking those beers and going through that motion and had an end result, right? It ended with a buzz and I wasn't getting the buzz and it did kind of irritate me. And I thought at that point, I was like, not alcoholic beer just isn't for me. I don't need to do it. It didn't necessarily make me want to drink, but I think I could have gotten there if I had kept drinking them. So I just made the decision for myself to not drink non-alcoholic beer. I have had clients in the past that have had non-alcoholic beer and then find out that it does have a tiny percentage of alcohol in it. And that can be upsetting for some people. So again, this is really more about knowing your boundaries and your threshold and what bothers you and what doesn't bother you. There's not a cookie cutter answer for every single person of what's right and what's wrong. But you have to be able to be honest with yourself and understand just like I did. Like I just knew that it made me uncomfortable. It didn't make me crave. It didn't make me run to the bar and order a real beer. None of that happened. It wasn't dramatic at all. It just made me feel a little weird. So I made the choice for myself to not drink it. But you have to be able to make that choice for yourself. The other thing I want to say about this is you guys, it's not about what is in my glass, right? Or what is in my bottle. It's not about what liquid it is, okay? It doesn't matter if you're drinking a bottle of water or a bottle of beer, right? As an alcoholic, it's about my relationship with the liquid that's in the glass. So I would urge you to also explore, like, what is the thing that's making you want to have a non-alcoholic beer or a non-alcoholic wine over just having a flavored soda water or a juice or whatever your thing is. Like, what is it for you that makes you want to have that specific liquid in your glass? Because that's the more concerning part to me. It's not that you want to have something pretty or drink out of a pretty glass. Like, I get that. But it doesn't matter what the liquid is. So if you're really struggling with this or thinking a lot about having something, an NA beer or wine or one of the spirits, there are so many things now. Um, I, I would really urge you to look at that. And why does it matter what's in your glass? Because that's not the important part. The other thing I would say for me is I would never be okay like with something something that mimicked the flavor of tequila right like the beer didn't bother me that much but i think if i had something non-alcoholic that actually tasted like tequila that would be challenging for me and i think just because it's a sensory thing, right? Like you associate those flavors with certain events or the lifestyle or being out or being in a bar, like all that stuff kind of goes together. And I don't think I would do very well if I had a non-alcoholic anything that mimicked the flavor of tequila. It just wouldn't it wouldn't be good for me. I think I would probably end up with a drink in my hand. And I don't know, I've always wondered this, if the um, non-alcoholic wines, if they really taste like their alcoholic counterparts, like does a non-alcoholic Merlot really taste like an alcohol Merlot? I don't know. And some of the spirits, like I feel like they have some gins now or rums that are non-alcoholic. Like, do they taste like the other ones? Um, because that would probably creep me out a little bit. And that's probably what creeped me out a little bit about the beer. So anyway, that's my take on non-alcoholic drinks. It really is like everything else in recovery. This is a deeply personal choice. You have to decide what's okay for you. And you have to be willing and capable to be a hundred percent honest with yourself about this. Like, don't feel like if it makes you feel some type of way, don't feel like, Oh, I can't say anything because I'm being weak or whatever the nonsense is. Don't fall into that trap. There is no reason to test yourself if there's no reason to test yourself. And there you have it. The one thing I want you to take away from almost everything that we talk about in recovery is it all is a very personal choice. You really have to understand yourself, understand what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with, and don't try to push yourself because you have some weird hang up about not being strong or I don't want to bother anybody. Everybody says that about calling when somebody relapses and I say, why didn't you call? Well, I didn't want to bother you. 
Like, let me worry about what bothers me. You know, <laughs> like that's for me to figure out. That's not for you to figure out. But you have to reach out. You have to do these things. You have to be aware of what your struggles are so that you can overcome them. Right. And like I said about me bartending for a long time, bartending did not bother me at all because I had no desire to drink. I didn't care about being around alcohol. I just don't want any in my mouth, you know? (laughs) So that didn't bother me. I would never recommend that for another person, right? Because other people, obviously that would be bothersome. Again, it doesn't make it right or wrong. It's just that we're all a little bit different. Like I have plenty of clients that drink non-alcoholic beer, but non-alcoholic beer kind of creeps me out. Like I just don't want, I don't want to mimic that flavor. It just takes me back to a different part of my life that did not go well, you know, (laughs) and I don't want to be, I don't want that kind of reminder, you know, that's just how I associate it. And I think the other thing too is like I talked about in that piece it really, what is the hang up with what's in your glass? You know what I'm saying? Especially like if it's that big of a deal to you, what your liquid looks like to the outside world, then drink out of a glass that they can't see what's in there. You know, I think again, that's the more concerning part to me is what is this connection to saying, I'm drinking non-alcoholic wine versus I'm drinking grape juice because it looks exactly the same. It basically is the same, I think. So what is like, really, what is the connection to that? There's a weird relationship to being so concerned about what's in that glass. And the last thing I'll say about this, I did have a client earlier this year. She went to the store. She got non-alcoholic wine. She got it home. And her husband had a pretty strong reaction to it. Nothing horrible, not negative. This wasn't a a big fight or anything. But to him, it felt like old behavior. I remember we just did an episode not very long ago about old behaviors, right? Whatever my behaviors and actions were in my drinking life, I don't want to carry that over into my sober life, right? I have to change things. If I want things to be different, things have to be different. and. Her husband's response was, this just feels like old behavior. So you went in the store, you had to think about it, you had to find it, you had to pick it, you know, like it was all of this sort of ritualistic behavior that was just like drinking alcohol. And I thought that was a very interesting piece too, because I hadn't really thought about it like that. But also taking you down an aisle in the store that is kind of a danger zone or taking you into a liquor store, which is a danger zone. So those are the things to think about with that. I hope you guys have loved this little compilation episode we've done. These are the most frequently asked questions that I get. And if you have questions, you want me to do a video and answer them or maybe put it on a podcast episode, message me in one of those hundred places that you can message me (laughs) because I'm everywhere. I get messages everywhere. I hope you're having a fantastic day and I will see you next week. You've reached the end of another great episode of the Addiction Unlimited podcast, candid and honest conversation about addiction and recovery. Be sure to visit us at addictionunlimited.com to join the conversation and access show notes and links to everything we talked about. Love this episode? Please take 30 seconds to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes to help us improve and give you the information you want. Thanks for listening. See you next week.